recognize that we live in this world made of gifts, and yet we're surrounded and indeed most of us enmeshed in institutions and a society which are relentlessly asking us, what more can we take from that bowl? What more can we take from that basket? And it seems to me that the question that we need that has us poised in this urgent moment is what does the earth ask of us? As we teeter on the brink of climate catastrophe, Belina mano ai kalehu aloha, aloha ua tu ahine, mai lua hine a iwa i kiki. Kia i ke kahau kani, kani no na leo, e o kama aina, aina aloha e. Mano ae. Belina me ke aloha ya kakoa pao, aloha. My name is Helena Kapuni Reynolds. I am a PhD candidate in the Department of American Studies here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. We'd like to greet you to the lands of Manoa, home of the Tuahine rain and the Kahaukani winds. Um, I have the pleasure of kind of serving as a little bit of an MC, but also to introduce our wonderful poets who are joining us this evening. First, we have Noo Rivela who is an OEV poet and educator whose debut book of poetry, Ask the Brindled, won the 2021 National Poetry Series. <laughs> Next, we have Donovan Kuhio Kalips, who is a poet and editor from Pu'ulo Ahu. His book, Proposed Editions, is being reprinted and will be released from Tin Fish Press next month. Third, we have Ihilani Lasconia, who is a student, artist, and organizer from Waimanalo O'ahu. And originally from Kula Maui, Brandy Nalani Mekduko is an OEV mother and teacher, the current poet laureate of Hawaii, and the author of Aina Hanau, Birthland, which will be released this summer. Now I will hand it over to our poets. And following their readings, we'll do a much more comprehensive um, introduction for our esteemed speaker this evening, Robin. So, mahalo ya o ko pakahia pao no ka aqua ko anamai ikea po. Aloha. Aloha kako. Mauna Kea. Inside me, two seeds. One planted in my throat, a dark highway fingered by Akua moonlight. The other seed raised in a fist of bright veins. Who will taste without swallowing my grove of lehua? In a world terrified of rain, who will kiss my kupu kupu mouth? Ovai ko kupu nahine. I carry these seeds like a child carries her grandmother's blood. O ka'aina no, o ka'aina no. Trucks still carry medicine, folding tables and hot food and water. Water, water, eola i kawai. 
The faithful still drive the dark highway to Kialahulu Kupuna, where the sky is so thin, thinnest of all skins come to stitch a new story, so thin I can still see bone. E kapo e ma ke e ku okoa. From seed to summit, our bones matter. O vai ko kupuna hine. O ka aina no. O ka aina no. Mahalo. Aloha. Uh, I'm going to do one poem uh, for you tonight, uh, but before that, just a short version of the true story of uh, how this poem was birthed. Um, many moons ago at a uh, graduate symposium, um, maybe some of you were there, called Words of the World, um, I got to hang out with a lot of amazing writers, a lot of my heroes. And after the symposium, the week-long symposium, we went to uh, Kumujan Osorio's house, and we hung out and asked him a very, very serious question about who his Almakua was. And he said, I think, I think it's the beanbag chair. <laughs> and the night went on, it was amazing. Um, I left their house, and in the car, halfway home, I realized I had Kumujan slippers on my feet. Um, so I returned it to him, but I can say that I was literally in, in Kumu John's shoes for about 30 minutes. And this is, strangely enough, where this poem comes from. Kahulu. Our kupuna put feathers on our words and the rain beads and we glide rising and diving piercing sea skin marks for mating signal verbed tongues from beak to beak our kupuna put feathers on our words that storms come, go, linger. Our feathers scatter the light and keep our stories warm. They harmonize us into the land with no lines to question where she ends and we begin. Our kupuna put feathers on our words to remind us how wonderful it is to ruffle our bodies in the stream. Mahalo. Aloha mai kākou, o ihi. This is a poem I call Hulihia. Liberation is birth, not borrowed. We will never return them their normalcy. Raised by the hands of matriarchs, the mind is a womb that conceives paths to collective freedom. Our bodies were made to not only bear children, birthing pains apply when pushing for a nation unbound to patriarchy. Love is not nuclear. Love is the revolution we dream of. This revolution will not be televised. It will be told through the lives of the sisters who carry us into this new world. A world we did not discover, but create every single day. A world that we raise in the image of ku, and Hina. In this world, we are not looking for a flag to state claim, but to truly see ourselves 
and each other, to truly know one another? Is it not our mothers who first called us by name? And so we stay behind, weaving baskets, braiding sweet grass, twisting maile to carry our sons, our daughters, our kupuna, our mo'opuna, our keiki, and makua in. Mahalo. Aloha. Uh, this poem is called Poi Ku, which you can interpret as haiku about poi, but <laughs> I do like to um, think that it's also to stand as poi. <laughs> okay. So, light stirred into earth, vai stirred into pa'iai, huli replanted. The makua share, the keiki have their own bowls, no fish in the poi. Nothing in the poi but poi, and kahi the sides of the bowl when pau. Keala's forehead after Christmas dinner. How did poi get up there? Early memory, poi, dries around your mouth like skin, like it always was. Yeah. Mahalo. <laughs> And please, mahalo, all these wonderful poets behind me, too. Mahalo. This was, um, this was our way of extending our um, uh, ho'okipa through poetry um, to welcome the wonderful um, Robin Walt Kimmerer here. And it's my great honor to introduce her this evening. So, bozo, aloha mai kako, o Brandy Nalani McDougal ko'inoa, Brandy Nalani McDougal in Dijnakas. I'm an associate professor of American studies um, here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and director of the Manoa Center for Humanities and Civic Engagement. Our, our esteemed speaker today, our wonderful speaker today, our wise speaker today, is Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer, an enrolled member of the Citizen Badawadami Nation a SUNY Distinguished Teaching Professor of Environmental Biology and the founder and director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment, an amazing center that has brought together so many people to enact the much needed change we need in our world towards sustainability and caring for our lands and waters. She's the author of two books, Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Knowledge, or Indigenous, excuse me, Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants, as well as the book Gathering Moss, A Natural and Cultural History of Mosses. Braiding Sweetgrass was recently adapted for young adults by Monique Gray Smith just last year to reinforce among younger readers how wider ecological understanding stems from listening to the Earth's oldest teachers, the plants around us. And last year, she was rightfully given, I'm so happy when this happens in this way, she was rightfully given the honor of being named a MacArthur Fellow. Yeah. <laughs> So, Bojo, Nininikan, Robin, um, e aloha, e ku'uho aloha. It's a tremendous honor to welcome you up here and mahalo for all that you teach us and all that you share 
um, mirroring the wonderful plants that you've learned from, too. Mahalo. <laughs> so moved by this beautiful crowd. I have to just breathe and be with you in this beautiful, loving environment. So, thank you. Mahalo. I'll begin with a traditional Potawatomi protocol greeting and say to you, Bojo Nikan. Shabadas gegish kokwe na dejnakas. Bodwe wad me kwenda. Megaze do dem minwa mokodo dem. Mikwech kinikeko gomijang. And in our beautiful Potawatomi language, I tell you that my name is Light Shining Through Sky Woman. I am a member of the Potawatomi Nation, the people of the fire, and a member of the Bear Clan and also of the Eagles. And I am so grateful to be here with you all. I don't speak much of our Potawatomi language because it is an endangered species, and our teachers tell us to share it with everyone whenever we get an opportunity. So I can't tell you how moving it is for me to be in a place where the language is alive, where the language is on your lips, where you answer back the poets in the language. Know and cherish this gift that you have here. Coming from far away, I can recognize what an, an amazing energy that is. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. It's also the way in our people that we always begin with gratitude. So I would ask us just to think back to this morning when we first put our feet on Shkak Mikwe, on Mother Earth, that she provided us with every single thing that we need that first breath of morning air, so sweet. <laughs> That's not a sweet sound. Let me see if I can get this right. Food to eat, a drink of water, the companionship of beloveds around us, of clouds in the sky and waves on the sand. How blessed we are that Mother Earth provides for us every single thing that we need. Miigwech also for our ancestors, for our teachers, for the ones who brought us here. I want to tell you a little bit about where I come from in upstate New York, Maple Nation, I like to think of it. But I also come from the territory where my neighbors are Haudenosaunee people. My neighbors and friends are people of the Longhouse. I myself am Anishinaabe. And long time before the settlers came here, the Anishinaabe in the Eastern Great Lakes and Western Great Lakes and our Haudenosaunee neighbors came to an agreement about how we would live in this beautiful, lush, abundant landscape. And so we say that we come from the land of the dish with one spoon. The dish with one spoon is a treaty belt. My Haudenosaunee neighbors have a copy. Our Anishinaabe leaders have a copy. And in this beautiful wampum belt, there is a dish that says, Mother Earth fills this dish for us, always. Fills it for all of us, human people and more than human people as well. And the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe agreed that we would live together, all eating from this same dish, and that we had a responsibility to that dish. Mother Earth filled it for us, but we have to keep it clean. We have to keep it full, because when it's empty, it's empty. This is dish with one spoon territory. So that dish on the treaty belt also has one spoon in it, one spoon for two peoples. 
It's a statement about justice, isn't it? It's a statement about sharing. It says that all of us will eat from this dish that Mother Earth fills for us. Not a big spoon for some people and a little tiny spoon for others. My neighbor and friend, Neil Patterson of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment says, you know, this is the oldest national, natural resource uh, management policy on, um, on uh, Turtle Island. And so of course it's taught in all our classrooms, right? Um, <laughs> right. When we think of all of the gifts that Mother Earth showers us with, most of the society that we live in, and certainly I as a professor in a college of natural resources, call these everyday miracles, ecosystem services or natural resources, as if they were simply waiting for, you know, to be transformed into a product and otherwise uh, useless. Um, you know, sometimes we do call them ecosystem services as if they were the inevitable outcome of some kind of ecological machine. But as we know here, to traditional people, to real humans, filling our basket with berries and therefore our bellies with pie, um, they are, we know they are gifts. They are not natural resources. They are gifts from our, from our relatives who surround us. And when with gratitude, when with a basket full of berries, we recognize that we live in this world made of gifts, and yet we're surrounded and indeed most of us enmeshed in institutions and a society which are relentlessly asking us, what more can we take from that bowl? What more can we take from that basket? And it seems to me that the question that we need that has us poised in this urgent moment is what does the earth ask of us? As we teeter on the brink of climate catastrophe, as we enter what is known as, becoming known as the age of the sixth extinction. And you know, when I speak to you this evening as a plant ecologist, yes, as a Western trained scientist, but most profoundly a student of indigenous science, of traditional ecological knowledge. So many of our educational institutions, and I suspect that is true here as well, teach not to say that the first natural resource policy was, was dish with one spoon. Um, we always start with Western science. We're always centering Western science. So I'm not going to replicate tonight what you have already heard, rather to engage in what we think of as, as two-eyed seeing, of, of looking at the world through the lens of the indigenous worldview and using selected tools of Western science. We can use some of those tools of Western science without adopting the Western exploitative world view. A question I want to start with is one I wrestle with a lot of how did we get to this place? How did we get to a place where we're in danger from our own atmosphere? And I want to think about that together. And of course, we know the proximate causes, right? Greenhouse gases, fossil fuels, industrial development, deforestation, capitalism, to name a few, right? But let's go deeper. Because it seems to me that for the past couple of centuries, which after all is just an eye blink of time in the lifetime of our species, it's as if we've been doing an experiment, an unintended experiment that is giving us now very tangible results. We have unwittingly asked what would happen if the societies in which we are embedded believed in this fictional pyramid of human exceptionalism that out of the 200 million species with whom we share the planet, there was one at the top of that pyramid who was somehow more deserving of the richness of the earth than any other. And not only that, in this experiment that we are doing, all the ecological laws that constrain growth and consumption don't apply to us. In this experiment, it is as if the laws of thermodynamics have been repealed on behalf of just our one species. 
This experiment tests the hypothesis. What would happen if we behaved as if the Earth was nothing more than stuff? This strictly materialist, utilitarian view of Earth, and moreover, that all that stuff belonged to us, to one species. Well, the results of that experiment are in, aren't they? What does the Earth ask of us? The Earth asks us to change. And yet, much of our environmental discourse is all about changing light bulbs. And don't get me wrong, you know, all the new technologies are going to be an important response. But as a scientist, I don't think it's more science that we need. I don't think it's more technology that we need. If we are to survive, and if our more than human relatives are to survive, we need to change a lot more than light bulbs. We need a change in worldview from a worldview that can think about land as natural resources or land as capital. Land as ecosystem services or most destructively land as private property. Let's think about what that really means. Land as private property is a rights-based concept that says this one being at the top of this pyramid of human exceptionalism has rights to land. What if we could shift with story, with hope, with song, with poetry, with art, and with science to the indigenous worldview in which land is understood first and foremost as our life giver, as our source of identity, that land isn't natural resources, land is the library, land is the knowledge holder and the teacher, land is the pharmacy, the healer for all of our ills, physical, mental, spiritual, physical, that the land is our relatives, to remember that the land is sacred. How different this concept of thinking of what land is, what land means. It's not a rights-based concept, right? We don't say that we have rights to the land. What we accept is our responsibility, our moral responsibility for the land. How do we propel such a shift? I think that we are living in this time of profound error. Because as you here especially know, for most of human's time on the planet, before this great delusion of human exceptionalism, we lived in cultures that understood ourselves not as this masters of the universe, but as my Haudenosaunee neighbors say, the younger brothers of creation. This Western scientific worldview that has so dominated our landscape like an agricultural monoculture for the past 500 years has yielded tremendous gains, right? In knowledge, in elements of, of human life without question. But it's not more knowledge that we need right now. It's wisdom. And generating wisdom is simply not within the purview of Western science. We need a science that draws upon mind, body, emotion, and spirit. We need indigenous knowledge, which is based on the recognition that we humans aren't atop some pyramid of life, but are a member of the democracy of species, surrounded by our teachers, surrounded by intelligences, not our own. This time that we are living in, of great challenge, of great change and of urgent choices has been foretold by our ancestors in the teachings of Nishnabe peoples that we call the prophecies of the seventh fire. It's a long and beautiful multi-layered story. I can only tell you just a little bit of it tonight. It's a migration story. Because our people started out at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River on the eastern shore among our Wabanaki Dawnland people relatives. But it is said that a prophet came among the people who said big changes are coming to Turtle Island. And in order to have the sacred fire uh, burn, we have to separate. The people have to separate and some of us need to move to the west to safeguard the sacred fire. And so they loaded 
the canoes and some of the people headed west through the Great Lakes down St. Lawrence to the Great Lakes on the, on the great migration of, of our people. We were told to keep moving to the west until we came to the place where the food grows on the water, to the land of, of wild rice. And in all of this time, these seven fires refer to seven eras, historical eras in, in, our, in our people's um, movement. And so at each time it was said that you have to keep moving because the ne- what's going to happen next is you're going to be separated from the land. People will, you will be pushed off from the land. Keep going. We know that that came to pass. And then another teacher arose and said, keep going because the black robes will come among us and try to break the circle of, of, our, of our spirituality. We know that came to pass. Each of these seven fires, there were warnings about what it was to come, warnings about how the language would be lost, warnings about how the children would be taken from us. And we know all of those things have come to pass. But it is also said that there will come a time after all of this tragedy, after all of this loss, that there will come a time when you can no longer dip your cup into the river and drink. That there will come a time when the air is too thick to breathe. And there will come a time when our beloved plant and animal relatives start to turn their faces away from us. We know that's where we are today. It has all unfolded. This is the time which is known as the time of the seventh fire. And in the time of the seventh fire, all the world's peoples, the original peoples and the newcomers as well, it is said, will stand at a fork in the road and have to make a choice. And you know, in my imagination, I think of one of those paths as all green and soft and dewy, and you could walk barefoot there. And the other path is a dead end, and it's made of burnt cinders. And to try to even walk there would cut your feet. And we're told we have to make a choice. That seems so easy, doesn't it? We know what path we want to walk down. But the brilliance of this teaching is it says, as we all stand there, we can't just go down that green path. What we are told to do is to walk backwards, to turn around on the path that our ancestors walked and pick up that which was left for us. Pick up the language. Pick up the stories. Pick up our plants and animal relatives. Pick up what we love too much to lose, put it in our bundles and carry it safely to the other side. That is our work. And our elders tell us that we are seventh fire people. This is the time of the seventh fire. And it is for all of us to ask ourselves that question. What do we love too much to lose that we will pick it up and carry it to safety? Carry it to the other side, because there is another side. The teachings go on to say that the people of the seventh fire who will need so much courage, they will need to link arms and do this work. They'll need courage. They'll need the resilience of our ancestors. But we will walk on that seventh fire path, on that green path, and light the eighth fire. Only when we have found these can we walk on that healing path together. What is it that we find along the ancestors' path that will heal us and bring us back to balance? What do we love too much to lose? To make this transformation of the seventh fire people, we say, let's get going. One of our beautiful songs of the seventh fire says, Ambe, Ambe, Majtara, come on, let's get going. And one of the things that we need to pick up along the ancestors' path are the stories, stories that I want to share with you this evening. 
And you know, faced with the problems that we have created for ourselves with our belief in this fictional pyramid of human exceptionalism, I don't know about you, but I just am longing for a teacher, a really wise grandma who would wrap her arms around me and tell me it's going to be all right and what it is that I need to do to go forward. It's a good thing she's here with us. We're told in our oldest teachings that the plants were left here for us as our teachers. It's said that sky women went back to the sky, but to become our Nokmas de Bakis is the grandmother moon, but she left behind the plants to teach us. Our plants are known, known, known not only as, as wise persons, but as the oldest teachers on, on earth. They've been here far longer than we have. They embody the virtues that we honor of generosity, of creativity, of, of always sharing. And who better to look to for guidance on how to live than beings who can take light and air and water and make it into food and give it away for free? who make medicine for us, for all of us, and give it away for free. There's a healthcare system you can rely on, uh, the, the medicines. Um, their numbers include the oldest, the largest, the tiniest, the most productive and powerful of, of our relatives. And whenever I'm wrestling with a question, I always go to the plants. I always go and ask them what they have to say about it. And how do they answer? You know, what if you were a teacher, a keeper of great knowledge, but you had no voice to speak it, and you had no pen to write it, and yet there was something you needed to say? Plants tell their stories not by what they say, but by what they do. And the name for plants in Anishinaabe Moan reminds us of this. All the plants are known collectively by the term mishkikin. And mishkikin means medicine. All the plants are called the medicines. And when you take that beautiful word, mishkikin, apart, we say, well, what, is, what does medicine really mean? It means that we are healed. Mishkikin means the strength of the earth. So what is it that does the healing? It's the strength of the earth. And it is a call for us all to be in the embrace of those, of those medicines. And in this year, which has been the warmest ever recorded, when glaciers are melting and storms rising and hundreds of our fellow species are in grave danger, it's important to remember that we don't have to innovate our way out of this alone because we have our, our teachers. This is, in a sense, equivalent, isn't it, to the new science of biomimicry, this so-called new area of study based on accessing the intelligence of nature for design, for engineering and environmental problem solving. I'll bet you have biomimetic scientists here at, at, at UH. And this so-called new discipline of learning from the land, um, termed biomimicry, has so often been used predictably, I suppose, restricted to learning what new products might be made, designed by, by nature, as it were. But what really interests me is the kind of biomimicry of what the plants might teach us about how it is that we could live. If plants are our teachers in this time of climate crisis, what could they teach us about responses to climate change if we were willing and capable of listening and learning? Because the plants know what to do about climate change, and they are doing it. They don't dither in ineffectual meetings and hearings and debate. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to listen to that? <laughs> They don't debate carbon tax structures, they just get, get to work. And I think they can be a model for the transformation that we need. Let me tell you what, how I'm thinking about this. I mean, after all, they have already converted 100% to a solar economy. <laughs> And you have probably heard that Richard Branson established the Virgin Earth Challenge to spur biomimetic designs of new technology that would remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it while we're transforming to a fossil fuel free economy, which we must do urgently. 
it's a lofty goal. It's critical deployment of human ingenuity and, and, and engineering on behalf of the climate. And the prize is $25 million. Um, human ingenuity will absolutely be part of the solution, but we should keep in mind that there already is a system that pulls carbon from the atmosphere, <laughs> stores it for centuries, and has even more bells and whistles. This invention can also generate oxygen, build soil, protect biodiversity, purify water, and makes us feel happy and peaceful. Oh, and it's called a forest. <laughs> um, uh, I say give the prize to the trees. Because plants aren't putting CO2 into the atmosphere, they're taking it out, aren't they? And storing it in the bodies of tree trunks in 12-foot deep roots of prairie grasses, in deep bogs of peat, and in fertile alluvial soils. And remember, after all, what are coal and oil after all but the stored carbon of prehistoric plants? These plants that stored away all of that carbon kept it out of the atmosphere until we decided to rip up the earth and burn tons of eons, really, of, of fossil carbon in just a few centuries. Plants know to keep it in the ground. They have been sequestering carbon since the beginning, removing it from the air. What do plants do when the climate changes? They grow faster. There is the so-called CO2 fertilization effect. More CO2, more raw material for photosynthesis in the atmosphere. But it's a very limited effect. They may grow faster, but what if there's not enough water and enough nitrogen and enough fertile soil? It's a dead end. As hard as they might try, the plants growing full tilt, they'll run out of the other things that they need like soil and rain. And here I've been so loving all the gentle rains and the torrential rains <laughs> that you've been having. And we know how plants purify the water and we give thanks for those rains. We have the plants to thank for the presence of rain. And as the world heats up, who is it that's creating oases of shade? Who cools our city's urban heat island effects but the trees doing sophisticated air conditioning without using a single watt of electricity? They don't ruin the land, they heal it. They are our teachers of restoration. And animals respond to climate change by moving. If they can, if there are places for them to go, but the plants can't do that, not fast enough. It takes much longer for our rooted relatives to move and adapt. But you know what they do? The plants under stress begin making more and more genetic diversity. They create more and more solutions for, um, for the future. They are the anti-Monsanto. They, they harbor genetic diversity rather than diminishing it, especially in partnership with indigenous farmers who know to, to shepherd and to help generate that, that diversity. The inherent capacity of the land for carbon drawdown needs to be a more important solution in our, in our climate strategies. We need every strategy, but to rely on the intelligence and the wisdom of the land to do this work is essential in, in, in climate policy. The sad truth, though, is that the carbon budget models, you've probably seen them, too, tell us that we're already past the point when forests alone and reforestation and, re and restoration can um, uh, be enough to reestablish carbon balance. Even if we could protect and invigorate every single forest, we have, in a sense, crippled the ability of forests to respond. The plants can't do this alone. They need us. They need us as stewards, as caretakers with hands in the earth, replanting, restoring, reforestation, remembering. 
Yes, plants are part of the solution. Yes, individuals are part of the solution. But we all know that our individual acts of reducing our carbon footprint are just a tiny fraction of the carbon emissions from institutions and industry fed by federal subsidies, right? Fed by an economy that incentivizes destruction over private, destruction for private gain over common good. And it's in time that we bring our imaginations and our voices together to create that new green economy for the future. If we think about the plants as our teachers, helping us imagine that new green future, if the plants are our oldest teachers, how do we become better students of those teachers? One of those ways, I think, is paying attention, that wonderful gift of paying attention to the plant world. And part of that has to do with knowing our neighbors, with knowing their names. Now, you might just laugh, well, she's a botany professor. Of course, she wants us all to learn the plant names. Um, I do. I really do. Um, <laughs> But why? Not that uh, you, know, you need to know the Linnaean name, as if plant taxonomy began in 1777. Um, but the notion of naming our plants and coming to know them as persons, as individuals, as, as our wise teachers, opens the door to restorative action. It opens the door to restorative justice on behalf of our plant relatives. Why? Because recognition of naming plants comes with a recognition of their personhood, doesn't it? Um, to say who you are. Um, and our laws today are all about governing our rights to the land, but this shift that we need is toward the rights of the land, the rights to be whole and healthy, the simple right to exist. I think about the wonderful rights of nature work that's being done all over the planet, primarily led by indigenous nations around the planet and on Turtle Island led by tribal governments who are passing um, rights of nature uh, legislation, amending their constitutions to recognize the inherent rights of rivers and forests and, and, and mountains. There's the global movement in indigenous-led nations in Bolivia and Ecuador who have enshrined the rights of nature in their constitutions um, and led the way at the United Nations to have the UN Declaration on the Rights of, of Mother Nature, which is currently before the UN. I had the privilege a few years ago of speaking to the UN, uh, to the General Assembly in, in um, support of, of the rights of, of Mother Nature. And I have to tell you that it was really interesting to stand in that room and see how many empty seats there were. And I asked, well, what, what's this about? Where, what are those empty seats? And you know who this, the empty chairs were? They said, oh, the people who aren't going to, who aren't concerned with this, don't bother to come to this. And you know where those empty seats were. Um, it was, to me, quite shocking, honestly, that the the major perpetrators were not, were not in the room. What I also wanted to talk about and connect this to indigenous languages where we began is that this notion of personhood of, of plants, of all of our relatives, of rivers and, and, and mountains, takes place not only in international courts and tribal constitutions, but in our everyday speech. And I want you to think about this for a second. Most of us probably in this room speak English as our first language. Our native language is in many cases nearly lost through assimilation and linguistic imperialism. One of the major losses, to me perhaps the most insidious of those losses in linguistic imperialism is captured in a single word and that word is it. It. In English, we refer to our family and to our fellow humans with a grammar of personhood, don't we? We say he and she. Would we ever say, if our beloved grandma was here, would we say, it's making soup? <laughs> we would not. 
right? We laugh at that, but it's, it's an anxious kind of laugh because that would be so rude. I would steal her personhood. I would objectify her by calling her it, right? Unthinkable that we would disrespect our beloved grandmother with that language. And yet, that is exactly how we speak of Grandmother Earth, as it, robbing her of respect, dignity, agency, objectifying the living world. Linguistics codes for our relationships with the world and who is included in our circle of respect and compassion. If a maple tree is an it, it's pretty easy to take up the chainsaw. But if it's a her or a him, we have at least to think twice. But interestingly, as a beginning student in Potawatomi language, and indeed in many other languages, I'm eager to hear about how this is dealt with in, in Hawaiian languages, we can never say it about birds or berries or trees or rivers. The language does not divide the world into masculine and feminine, as some romance languages do, but into animate and inanimate ways of thinking and beings. In fact, you know, English is such a noun-based language. Some 70% of the words in English are nouns which seems somehow appropriate to cultures so obsessed with things. Um, in Potawatomi languages and in many indigenous languages, it's a verb-based language. About 60% of our words are, are verbs. They are verbs. They're ways of, of being. This, and so there's actually like a different verb for hearing um, uh, a bird singing than for hearing an airplane go over. We have different words so that we always honor those beings who are, are animate. And the grammar of animacy is applied to everyone who lives, sturgeons and mayflies and blueberries and boulders and, and rivers. We refer to the members of the living world with the same language that we use for our family because... It's our family. If we are to survive here, and if our plant and animal relatives are to survive here as well, we need to learn to speak the grammar of animacy. As we reclaim our indigenous languages, we also reclaim respectful relationship to, to the earth. And make no mistake, indigenous language is an antidote to climate change and healing for the earth in its extension of compassion, personhood, agency, and respect to the living world. I've been playing a lot with this notion of how might we animate the English language. I think about this especially as a scientist because when I'm writing technical papers, the plants who you know have been my teachers for all of these decades, I have to refer to as it. On the, on the paper. It, to me, it seems so disrespectful. Um, and so I've been trying to think about, are there ways that we might replace itting the world? I'm glad you laughed at that. Are you open to trying this? Um, you know, um, I asked my language teacher about this. I said, in Potawatomi, do, do we have a word for just a being? Not a he or a she or, or an object or a subject, it's a being. What would the word for a being be? And he said it was bamadizi aki, my wonderful elder, Stuart Kingbun. And I was glad to know we had that word, bamadizi aki, but I didn't think it was going to slide into English anytime soon. <laughs> but you know what? The end of that word, but Madasi Aki refers to the, a really good balanced being um, of the earth. The Aki part is the earth. What about the last sound, Aki? What if we spoke of the living world as he, she, ki, and it? Couldn't we have an animate pronoun for the earth so that we didn't have to objectify our, our living relatives. We could say, um, instead, I'm going to go drill that 
it, that maple tree, we could say Ki is giving us the gift of syrup this spring. Um, it changes everything. Try it. Try it. And when I ask my students to, they say, well, they stumble a little bit. But it makes them feel related um, to speak of, of Ki instead of it. And you know, we're going to need a plural pronoun as well. And one of the ways in Potawatomi that we pluralize things is by adding an N. And so we already have in English a beautiful word of kin. What if we came to say kin or flying south for the winter? Come back soon, we'll miss you. I don't think we need any more words for exploitation and objectification of the living world. We need words that bring us every breath, every time we speak of them, into kinship with the living world. You know, when I was, apologies to English faculty, but when I was in school and having to diagram sentences and all of that, you know, I, I, I detested grammar. Um, so I find it really funny now to be advocating for grammatical changes as in, in, in transformation. Um, but I think of ki and kin potentially as the pronouns of the revolution. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> You know, I realize that I am probably going way over time, so I'm going to... I am, right? Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> you just get me started, I don't know. Um, so, what I want to um, s sort of begin to pull all of this together with is, is to say that one of the things that I hope that we can pick up along that ancestor path and carry with us into the future are the concepts of taking from the world as we must because we can't photosynthesize. We, have to, we do have to take from the world. But you know what? If you think about the world as it, it, as natural resources, as property, it doesn't matter how you take because it's all yours. It's just stuff. But when you think about the world as kin, you have to take in a very different way. You have to accept the gifts of your relatives in a respectful way. Way And this is what is known as the concepts of the honorable harvest, to bring ourselves once again into honor with our relatives. We need acts of restoration, not only for water and land. We need a restoration of honor to the way in which we live. And the reward is not just a feel-good sense of responsibility. It may save our lives. Our economies and our institutions enmesh us all in a profoundly dishonorable harvest. And collectively, by assent or by our inaction, we have chosen the policies that we live by. And we need to choose again. We can choose reciprocity. We can choose to sustain the lives that sustain us. That's what the plants are teaching us, the teachings of reciprocity. Think of it, these plant teachers, brilliant, gentle, wise, creative, intelligent, sacred beings who give and give and give. They are doing their best to help, doing their best to save the world against human folly, trying to hold it all together until the industrial society grows out of its destructive adolescence and grows into wisdom. They're making forests, they're making soils, they're making food and medicine and homes for all beings and trying, I feel them trying to hold back climate change. They are trying so hard to save the world. And instead of showering them with the gratitude and the respect they are owed, we cut them down, dig them up, enslave them, poison them in an act of betrayal so profound it threatens the continuity of life. What do you suppose it's going to be like at the moment when people wake up and realize that they have ground our oldest teachers underfoot? I am going to end with a story to help us focus on that moment when we wake up and what will we do. 
We are living in mythic times, aren't we? And we can turn again to our myths, our ancient stories, to guide us. And this is a story that I turn to again and again for hope and energy. It's a story that I heard from Haudenosaunee elder Tom Porter, sitting at his house in Ghana Johalege, where we'd been doing restoration work with sweetgrass. And he took out of the drawer a little bag, a deerskin bag of stones, and put them out on the table. And he told me about the time when Sky Woman, our creator woman, when her grandsons, the twins, were in conflict about the future of the beautiful world. Those two boys, I should tell you, um, were, were in, when they were in her womb, they were fighting even then. Um, and one was saying, it's too crowded in here, I want out. Um, and one was saying, there's a way that this happens. Um, be patient, go with the way that, 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 that life emerges. But one of the twins cut his way out killing his mother. And so the two twins were raised by their grandma. And these boys were charged with helping make the future earth. And the twin, one of the twins, he was so kind and generous, he went around making blackberry bushes so that the people to follow would have delicious fruit. And then, you know, that other twin, he went around and put the thorns on them. Um, yeah. One twin made the rivers run in two directions at once, so you never had to paddle upstream. Um, and I think you know what happened to that good idea. Even the maple trees, did you know that one time under the hand of, the, of sapling, the gentle twin, maple syrup came out of maple trees all thick and brown and sweet, just right out of the tree. You could lie underneath it and, and uh, yeah. Well, and Flint went into the river and poured buckets of water into those maple trees. So now we have to work so hard. You get the picture of, of, of who these twins were. Always a struggle between the twin forces of creation and destruction who are always with us. And they decided that the world's fate would be decided not by their endless wrestling and one-upsmanship, but in a game, a game played with peach stones. To decide the fate of the world, they decided to match their skills in what we call today the peach stone game. And the, these peach stones are usually peach pits that are painted black on one side and, and, and white on the other. And the player shakes the bowl and tosses the stones all up into the air. And only when all the stones have turned one way, all black or all white in the bottom of the bowl, is a winner declared. That's what you're really going for. And in this game, the fate of life on earth was to be decided by the winner of this game. If all the stones came up black, flint would prevail and destruction would be loosed upon the world. Should they all fall white, then the world would continue under the generous hand of creation. They played and they played without a winner. They tossed the seeds for hours back and forth and back and forth. And with every throw, two boys gambled with the future of the world. Would life continue as we know it or would all be lost? It's such an ancient story, and yet couldn't feel more contemporary as we gamble with the future of the earth, with the continuity of life. On and on the boys played all night long until the glimmer of light at the eastern horizon warned them that time was almost up. They could make only one more throw as the pink of dawn colored their faces. The stones flew into the air for the last time and began to clatter one by one into the bowl. The first one came up black, and the next, and the next, and the next. All the stones were black until there was only a single seed 
still hanging in the air, tumbling and spinning on its way to the bowl to join the others. And all the other beings watched in terror as humans gambled with life. At the moment when all life hung in the balance, it is said that all the members of creation, the trees, the fish, the berries, the grasses, the birds, the two-legged, the four-legged, the many-legged, the no-legged, they all drew in their breaths as the last stone tumbled. And together, all of creation gave a mighty shout. And its force caused the human foolishness to be overruled. And the power of their voices turned that last stone over as it fell into the dish, the color of trillium blooming in spring, the color of mother's milk, of moonlit snow, the color of a polar bear. I've tried to imagine the sound of that shout the roars, the panting, the swishing of grasses. In my imagination, I feel rather than hear their voices. Large ones, small ones, chirps, hoots, buzzes, howls and flutters, scrapes, squeaks, leaf flutters, needle whispers, spine quivers, Buds swelling, seeds bursting, roots pushing, spores popping, and the vibration of the membrane in the smallest microbe. They all coalesced in a great wailing wind, so cohesive in strength and direction that it stopped the stone, spun it around, held it poised in midair, and set it down, life side up. It was the mighty shout of creation that saved the beautiful world, but here we are, gambling again with the fate of the earth, and the plants and the birds and the salamanders and the starfish are all trying to make that mighty shout, but we've weakened them to the point that their voices are threadbare and faint, just a raspy whisper that can barely be heard over the roar of bulldozers. All this time they have stood for us, and we repay them with betrayal, with silence as destruction reigns. Now it is we humans who must give the mighty shout. I've tried to imagine what it would sound like to offer my own mighty, primal shout for life. And as a scientist and a writer of the beauty of the land, I imagine that sound would be something like the Hallelujah Chorus. But to my dismay, what comes from my throat is a wail of anguish at the realization of what we have done. A great cry of shame and howl of grief for creation. It surprised me that my shout was a raging no and not a yes of encouragement to the rest of creation. And that scared me at first. But there's wisdom there, isn't there, in understanding that grief is the measure of the depth of love and that love is the material of transformation. Feeling the wounds of the world propels us in this time. In order to say yes to creation, we also have to say no to destruction and resist, resist, resist on behalf of the good green world. And then out of the powerful love that we all share for this beautiful, abundant earth, raise our voices in the song that will save us. The other beings are waiting to join us in that mighty shout. Ambe, mashtara. Let's get going. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh. Mm -hmm.